Hi everybody, uh, I'm still Alistair Wayman, um, work at Airbus Defence and Space in the UK and I am part of one of the study teams um, for the uh, Fogel Sample Return study that, um, uh, that that left slides uh, showed earlier on. So as you saw, um, Phobos Sample Return is a candidate uh, post-ExoMars mission. Um, so ExoMars is the rover vehicle is going to land on uh, launch to Mars in 2020, and this is a potential follow-on mission for that. The aim of it, as you saw, acquire 100 grams of sample um, and bring it back to Earth. That will give us a lot of information on, as you as you know, about the Martian moons. But uh, one of the key aspects as well is that in several aspects, it will act as an end-to-end -end demonstration for sample return from Mars orbit. I'm going to focus primarily on the ESA standalone scenario, so I'm not going to talk too much about the uh, joint baseline or jo joint backup scenarios. For the ESA standalone scenario, um, we will launch aboard an Ariane 5 in October 2025. Um, we'll then acquire the sample from the Phobos surface in May 28, um, and then the sample will be returned back into the Earth's atmosphere in August 2030. The project that we've done studied um, the Phobos sample return mission up to phase A level, um, so we were working on elaborating the system and spacecraft design with the primary goal to demonstrate the feasibility of the mission in terms of uh, the programmatics, uh, the technical aspects, and then also um, the budgetary aspects as well. Because of the work share agreement, um, we were mandated to use uh, a four module architecture. So the first uh, module, the, 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 the one that would be on the bottom of the composite, is the propulsion module. Um, ironically, it's at the top of this uh, slide here. So this would carry the whole composite towards uh, over to the Martian system and perform all of the large delta-V maneuvers that need to be done. Um, this would be done using a European 1.1 kilonewton bipropellant engine to give high efficiency. Above that would sit the lander module, so this would carry um, in the ESA standalone scenario all of the science payload as well as the sampling system. It would perform a power descent down to, the, um, down to just above the surface, um, around about 50 meters above the surface. From there, we would then free fall down onto the surface to reduce the contamination. To further reduce that contamination of the surface of the area that we're going to sample, um, we would also use a dual mode propulsion system. So we'd have, uh, be able to operate that in bipropellant mode um, so that it would be very efficient during all the orbital phases. But the downside of that is that it produces quite a lot of carbon contamination. So during the descent, we would then operate it in um, a purely monopropellant mode to reduce that carbon contamination of the surface. In all the scenarios, um, this lander module remains on the surface, although, as I said um, earlier, once the, um, the, the next module, the Earth return vehicle, ascends in the standalone scenario, um, it, it dies. The reason for that is that um, all of the intelligence of the mission is housed within the Earth return vehicle. Um, it controls the entire composite throughout the mission. Um, and it also, once it's ascended from the surface, carries the Earth reentry capsule all the way back to Earth. Then the final module, uh, the Earth reentry capsule, the one on the bottom uh, of this slide, that's the one that actually contains the sample and performs the uh, atmospheric reentry uh, before performing a hard landing in Woomera in, in Australia. So we, um, this is one of the aspects where we'll act as a, a precursor to an eventual Mars sample return mission because we won't have any parachutes within the uh, Earth reentry capsule, so it'll be a, a full hard landing. Um, you saw some of the payloads that we'd have um, on board the spacecraft previously, and this just shows you the configuration of the spacecraft and then also um, the accommodation of those. You can see the close-up imager. Um, is that going to work? What's that? So you can see the you can see the close-up imager uh, down here on the end of the robotic arm. Um, you can then also see a stereo camera uh, on the top floor of the lander module, and then the uh, two visible cameras, the NAC and the WAC, and then um, the two spectrometers, they're all mounted on a common panel to reduce the um, thermal distortions between them and maintain uh, the color alignment. So to step you through what the mission will do, um, as I said, we'll launch in 2025 on board an Ariane 5, and that will place us directly onto a, a Mars transfer orbit. We'll then arrive in the Martian system um, and phase ourselves uh, with Deimos. 
In the ESA standalone scenario, they will then perform a series of flybys um, past Phobos, imaging uh, at least 10% of it down to a resolution of 1.5 meters per pixel. And following that, we'll then transfer over to Phobos, um, release the propulsion module, and then enter uh, into a, a quasi-satellite orbit around about Phobos. From this, um, we will map at least 50% of the surface of Phobos down to a resolution, again, of 1.5 meters per pixel. We'll actually be able to capture images of um, the, entire uh, the entire surface of Phobos between plus or minus 60 degrees latitude. But because of the um, communication system, the amount of data that we can get back limits us to, um, to about 50% coverage of the surface. Um, so once we've done that, we'll then select three potential landing sites, perform um, some low altitude flybys over those to get high resolution imagery down to about seven and a half centimeters per pixel. We'll also perform two flybys for radio science experiments as well. So that will provide um, 10 hours of un uninterrupted uh, radio science per flyby. And then once we've selected uh, the landing site, we'll then descend down onto the Phobos surface. As I said, this will be ended by a 50 meter freefall um, to ensure that the sample isn't, can, is uh, not excessively contaminated by the propulsion system. Once on the surface, we'll follow uh, an image-based decision process um, where we'll take gradually higher resolution images of potential sampling sites until we then do the final sampling and transfer it back to the uh, Earth reentry capsule. In total, for the ESA standalone scenario, we'll spend about 100 Phobos days on the surface, so around about one Earth month. Once we've done the sampling, um, we'll then ascend, the Earth return vehicle will then ascend from the surface um, and place itself onto um, an Earth return trajectory. Um, we'll have to do an Earth swing by about six months um, before uh, the re-entry of the Earth, re Earth uh, re-entry capsule. That will separate from the ERV about 24 hours um, before the final re-entry. And as I said, the landing will be performed uh, at Woomera in Australia. So we talked a little bit earlier on about surface success, uh, about where were the interesting locations to sample. So I thought I'd uh, include this slide, which shows um, the surface accessibility um, for the baseline landing date. What you can see in the center is uh, the blue line there. That's the subsolar latitude. And then the two outer lines are 20 degrees uh, latitude either side of that. Because of the power um, constraints placed by the power system, uh, landing site is always going to have to be within 20 degrees of the subsolar latitude. What you can also see here is that on the left-hand side, um, you can see there's a large area that, that's red, that Stickney crater, indicating that we can't land there, primarily because of the uh, local slopes. And then if um, we were at a different date, the area down here would also be inaccessible, again, due to the, uh, due to the local slopes. We identified uh, four technologies that need to be de developed within Europe to um, make this mission feasible. So the first of those is the proximity GNC system, um, which would be used to perform the descent down to the surface primarily. This would be a vision-based navigation system um, that would rely on a radar altimeter, but also a wide-angle visible camera. From the images of this, we would extract um, a series of features and track those um, for relative navigation against the surface. The spacecraft trajectory would then be designed to uh, gradually tighten during the one and a half hour descent um, to the point where the errors are minimized at the top of the free fall, as I said, about 50 meters above uh, the surface. We traded this off against a uh, descent that involved uh, a waypoint where we could hover and get an absolute navigation update from the ground. But we found that this um, was a preferable solution and it, as it was uh, lower delta V, uh, very simple and robust, um, allowed the descent to, in, to occur in, within one Phobos daylight period and also provided us the... Um, the accuracy that we needed. So the, uh, in the previous presentation, uh, it showed that the accuracy required was 50 meters. We can provide uh, a less than 35 meter landing accuracy. The second technology is uh, the landing gear. So this would consist, um, as I said a second ago, of four fixed landing legs attached to the lander module. Um, we went for fixed landing legs as that's a low mass and low risk option. There's no, no probability of them not deploying. 
There'd be crushable dampers in the primary struts to absorb the uh, energy during landing, and then there'd be load limiters in the secondary strut as well. One disadvantage of going for fixed landing legs is that the footprint um, of that landing gear is limited by the launch vehicle fairing. And so to ensure that we have a uh, safe landing with no rebound or anything like that, and no toppling, uh, we need to use hold down thrusters. So we'll fire these 140 newtons vertical thrust they'll give us for up to 25 seconds, which will allow us to tranquilize on the surface. The uh, landing gear gives us um, a maximum envelope with, within which uh, we can land in terms of the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity, uh, as well as the slopes. All of these are related to the local uh, gravity of the landing site, which varies across the surface of Phobos. So this is one of the uh, parameters that restricts whereabouts on the surface of Phobos we can land. The third um, technology that we need to de further develop is um, the sampling chain. So for our study, um, we're one of two uh, competing teams. For our study, we, will, we baseline the rotary brush sampling mechanism, um, which you can see on the right-hand side. This is a very early test. There's been a lot more development going on within Europe on this. Um, that essentially is two contra-rotating brushes that, that flicks regolith up into a sample container and will allow us to, to acquire a, a variety of different sample sizes. We'll then use a camera-based verification system to confirm that we have the required amount of sample and also the um, correct distribution of sizes within that sample. All of this will be mounted on the end of a four degree of freedom robotic arm that will perform the sample transfer. Um, and will allow us to sample anywhere within a 1.6 meter radius of the um, attachment point, as you can see in the uh, image on the bottom right. Throughout the sampling chain, there'll be a series of witness plates to record any contamination so that we can characterize that um, to support the scientific analysis once it's back uh, on Earth. The fourth development um, that needs to be done is focused on the Earth reentry capsule. So this is a really important part because it protects the sample container during the atmospheric reentry. It will be spun up during the release from the um, Earth return vehicle and be able to perform a completely passive entry without any parachute up to 12 and a half kilometers a second. It's about three quarters of a meter in size, weighs about 35 kilos, about half of me. Um, and as I said, it will perform a hard landing. One of the key requirements was to ensure that the sample uh, G loading stayed below 2000 G. So we'll have, um, again, some crushable material in here. And our analysis has showed that the sample G loading shouldn't exceed 1200 G. The landing ellipse will be about 80 kilometers by 25 kilometers. And we've got a requirement that it should be able to be um, collected within four hours of landing. So to enable this, we're also going to have a, a GPS beacon um, on board the, the, the Earth reentry capsule so that then we can rapidly locate it after, after it's re-entered. There's already been quite a lot of activity started in support of these developments. Um, the Earth reentry capsule has been previously studied as part of the, um, and tested as part of the Marco Polo um, program within uh, Europe, and the other three technologies all have um, full-scale breadboarding and test programs underway. So in conclusion, um, the phase A study that we've performed has demonstrated uh, the mission feasibility. We haven't found any technical showstoppers, and we've demonstrated that all of the science requirements can be met. Uh, we've identified the key risks to the project and mitigated those. Um, that includes uh, identifying the four key technologies. Um, and as I said, several activities are already underway to develop those further. Going, looking towards the future, as Pascal said a minute ago, um, the next step is to go to the 2016 uh, European Space Agency Ministerial Council, which is towards the end of this year, um, where there will be a funding request for the, for the Phase B1, which we're, we're relatively hopeful will, will be successful. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd welcome any questions. Uh, Dan Britt, University of Central Florida. Um, a lot of the, the small body sample return proposals and missions use a touch and go sampler. Why are you, uh, I would think there would be a considerable mass penalty for doing a lander. Why are you going that direction? 
Uh, we have investigated investigated a touch and go sampling mechanism. Um, the problem with touch and go for this is because you've got to get yourself out of such a big gravity well. Um, you're essentially carrying back a lot of dead mass on the return traject on the return transfer. So the uh, snowball effect is that actually it becomes more mass efficient to um, have a, a staged approach. Well, I did a discovery proposal and a Mars Scout proposal for just this sort of mission. And I was able to get there and back on a Delta, a Delta II. We think and we can just about get there, get there and back doing touch and go on an Ariane 5. Okay. So we've, we've investigated it, but we think that this way is the more mass optimized way, but you've got a lot more interfaces to, to deal with. So it's got its own drawbacks as well. Yeah, actively? Uh, not actively, certainly passively during re-entry, um, but we've done quite a lot of analysis into it, and we um, and we've shown that it won't exceed 40 degrees Celsius during the during the entire mission. That was one of the key requirements that was was placed on us to stop any of the volatiles evolving. And speaking of sample return, this was the case for ESA only. Uh, yes, this is this is the ESA only, ESA okay. only scenario. And so, is the is the core sample? With a different scenario? Uh, no. So the CORA uh, mechanism, so there, there's been two parallel studies that have been done, one by us at Airbus Defence and Space UK, and then another one by Talas Alenia Space in Italy. And we had um, free choice over the two sampling mechanisms. Um, at Airbus, we've got more confidence in the, um, in the rotary brush mechanism, but at Tales, they've gone down the other route, I believe. They've they've baselined the uh, Cora mechanism. Sorry, Cameron. I was going to say because we've been talking about Demos material, sort of coating Phobos. I don't know what kind of depth we're talking about, but I just wonder if you're gonna with your brushes, if you're gonna it be would, scooping up Demos. It would be from uh, high up in the in the in the surface, so it would be kind of the first. I don't know how deep, but but yeah, deep maybe first few centimeters. So if, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that I was aware of from earlier on as well. It's one of the things that I was thinking with, with both of the, the mechanisms. I think if there is significant um, contamination from DEMOS, then that, that would be acquired. Yeah. That's what you would be sampling. Right, but how how deep is the is the demos material expected to be? And 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 would you get past it with that kind of mechanism? Yeah. What do the rotary brush systems do to the volatiles during the sampling process? Do you, do you release the volatiles? I guess they'd stay in your system. Though. I don't know. I believe, uh, it, at least from what I remember, this looked like the same kind of sampling system that uh, was proposed for Marco Polo. Uh, yes, it's exactly the same. And the Marco Polo target was a volatile rich um, asteroid. It was a, a C-type that they thought had hydrated minerals. So I, I don't think it would, I don't think the brushing, it's just a brush. I don't think it would, it would drive off voluntarily. Well, in this part of uh, space, you would not expect to find ices and things close to the surface anyway. So whatever volatiles you have would be locked in the crystal structure. And it wouldn't make any difference, nor would it make any difference to, um, for the reentry scenario. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.